Matt. And this is Billy. And we are the Bible Bro Down. This is our first episode. We are a new podcast coming out to talk about theology, talk about soteriology, talk about some of the more difficult aspects of Christianity that people may not necessarily want to talk about. Or you may find podcasts that are uh, Reformed. In fact, there I think most podcasts are on the Reformed side. And uh, we are not. We are not Calvinists. That'll be a big focus probably at the beginning of this podcast is what exactly we believe, why we differ from Calvinism, uh, why we differ from maybe Arminian, Arminians as well, why we differ from the traditional view. We are Baptists, but we are a little different. So that's that's the goal here. Right now, we're going to give you just kind of an overview who we are, what it is we've done so far in our ministry, and uh, hopefully you come back and keep listening to us. We look forward to, to going over some stuff. So, Billy, you want to give us kind of a rundown of where we came from? <laughs> Are we coming out of the blue? Are we just making a bunch of junk up or, or what? Sure. So, let's see. Me and Matt have known each other for 12 years. I'm not going to go into detail of, like, our whole history, but just to let you guys know, we met 12 years ago playing an online game and learned that we were both Christians and liked theology and, and liked teaching, and now we're here, 12 years later, still doing the same thing. And now still we're nerds. Longer. Yeah, still nerds, but no longer playing the same <laughs> the same game. Yeah. About, so let's see, we are in October 2016, so last summer of 2015, probably around May, um, yeah. Matt and I were talking about theology, like always, and I had mentioned to Matt that probably about four years ago, I had some, basically I had some spiritual awakening, some, these things that I've known my whole life or thought were true my whole life. Do I really know why they're true? Have I ever studied the Bible as a learner and not somebody who wants to you know, conform the Bible to what I think I know. And Matt basically said, oh, so, you know, what do you believe that's different than you, you know, that, that you believed in the past? And I kind of gave him a list of various things. And in that list, Matt, of course, being uh, at that time the, the high Calvinist that he was, you know, pointed at, at uh, you know, having a choice in salvation and such and said, oh, well, we need to talk about that. As a good Calvinist, I recognized that my friend was completely wrong and had no idea what he was talking about, and so I wanted to correct it, because that's what Calvinists do, is we like to correct people and gently nudge them in the reformed direction. No, maybe that's an overgeneralization, but uh, that was the case for me. I definitely wanted to, to point out to my not-so-smart friend that, that he was wrong. So, And actually, that's actually, you know, kind of brings up one of the, the points of why we're doing this podcast, is that, as Matt mentioned... There's many, many podcasts are, are of the Calvinist slant, in essence. Matt was thoroughly familiar with all of those for about 10 years. He he liked to listen to those, you know, the James White, the Al Mohler, the J.D. Hall. Um, all the big guys. Yeah, oh, all yeah. the big guys. R.C. Sproul, listen to all of them. Everything yeah. from Ligonier, yeah. Matt Matt was pretty thorough in his, in, in his Calvinism, and a lot of people appeal to Calvinism basically because they kind of go from that nothing theology, you know, that uh, I'm going to steal something from Leighton Flowers, for those of you who know who he is, that Joel Olstein or uh, what's another guy out there who doesn't have a lot of deep theology. <laughs> that's still oh, big. That, I think it's safe to say that's most people. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, so basically, let, well, let, let me let me explain. Cause so where I came from was I, I wasn't I was definitely not Calvinist in high school so growing up because i just didn't see why that a loving god would predestine people individually but it was all emotional i didn't really have a good reason for why it was wrong so when i got to college this is about 11 years ago now when i got to college i was challenged with some of this stuff and people gave me a systematic understanding of all of scripture that yes it, it had some holes but that there was that was all pointing all those holes all those mysteries were answered by basically the sovereignty of god that was the response if you didn't know why someone was saved versus someone else well the sovereignty of god we we don't get to know that that's not our place romans 9 who are you to answer back to god and i was happy with that i i had i had, I had from beginning to end a way to understand scripture the problem was there were too many holes and when Billy and I started talking last summer, we, we did the natural, if you're a Calvinist or a non-Calvinist and you've discussed with the other side at any length, you've done what we did and you threw verses at each other for who knows how long. What was the page count, Billy, on the emails that we sent back and forth? Well, it was about a three-month-long, quote-unquote, 
bro down. <laughs> we had probably over a hundred pages worth of like a word document. I transferred them all over to a word document to because it just became easier to track that way. <laughs> yeah, we had well over a hundred pages of throwing scripture back and forth at each other. And what I like to work. yeah, what I like to to the the analogy or the picture that I like to do is that you know three months. This is what we were trying to do, and what what it is is that you know i had you know 10 levels on my building and foundation of what i believed matt had 10 10 10 floors you know of calvinism and we were both you know on our own separate buildings with all these different foundations underneath us and we were trying to argue our points of view but neither of us could ever come to any f- sort of unity because of all these foundational beliefs that we held that were different and after three months, I, we finally kind of both saw the light and said, "Hey, we need to we need to start on the ground floor together and kind of work our way up and see, you know, let's conform to Scripture and see what happens." And and as as a lot of uh, Calvinists end up relying on, uh, you know, Matt used Romans nine a lot, so I said, "Well, let's go through Romans nine together." But before we can do that, let's get it in context. So let's start in Romans one. So we actually went through the entire book of Romans together, verse by verse, determining what it said and coming to a unified understanding of what it said. And it was so eye-opening and so uh, it was such a blessing to... to Because our, our focus, like I said in the beginning, was, was, all right, let's look at Scripture as somebody who is trying to learn. Not that we know anything, but somebody that's trying to learn. Not somebody who knows exactly what they believe and they're going to conform whatever they read to what they think they know, but somebody who actually knows nothing and wants God to teach us. And then that's what we did through the so entire... So is, is it safe to say that the, the process may have been uh, kind of tedious, maybe? Because we did we did agree that if we reached a point, you know, even if it was in chapter 1, verse, I don't know, 4, we were going to stop if we disagreed and figure out what it meant, uh, whether that was looking at... We, we didn't really depend a lot on commentary because really you can find a commentary to, to, to match any stance you want. But we would look at, at some of the, the more objective commentaries that explain the Greek. We would, we would really focus down on specific places where we had disagreements uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to make sure as we move forward we were on the same page. So it, it, it did take a while. <laughs> it was a very, uh, very... How long did that take, actually? That was about... Going through the Book of Romans? Oh, uh, I don't... Well, you know, by the time we got to actually chapter 9, Matt had already changed his view about Calvinism, and but we were still continuing to go through the book and, and learn things. And I remember writing and rewriting and then rewriting uh, the book of just on the section on Romans. Our section on Romans is what, like 30, 30 20 to 30 pages just on chapter 9. I, I think I rewrote it from scratch probably five or six times and you know I basically that's you know I would go through it and then I would uh, I'd be writing it and I'd get down to like verse 22 and then something you know in verse 22 or whatever uh, you know would cause me to go back into the Old Testament because there's like seven or eight different instances where Paul quotes from the Old Testament so in order to understand what he means you have to go back there and find out what that means so I'd go back and do that and, and there'd be some little difference that kind of changed you know everything so i'd go back and re- it was just a very intensive process but it was so eye opening so would you say that that even now i mean as we were doing that process we landed at a certain point but it, you know fast forward 6 months to you know this summer a year after that discussion started i would say we 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 are more settled in our soteriology at this point but still drastically different even than when we finished romans yeah we definitely have it's interesting that you you bring that up. You know, you just uh, Matt just wrote a draft for difficult scriptures. Basically, you know, why is interpreting a passage difficult? And uh, what was interesting is uh, Matt, you know, kind of goes through various different things. But one thing that I don't think he mentioned that I uh, hey Matt, this is me mentioning it <laughs> um, <laughs> is a lot of times we can't understand a passage until we understand something else. It's that that building blocks. You you understand what I'm saying? 
Oh yeah, sure. You gotta you gotta start at the bottom of your systematic and work your way up. Yeah, and and there's a lot of things you know that we go to today, and like, oh, now that makes so much more sense because of mm-hmm. you know you know we we have this other foundation underneath this, and it's just like you know, well, why do I need a savior? Um, well, because I'm a sinner. <laughs> you have to you have to understand that you're a sinner before you can need a savior. So you know, if you come down to all the all these passages that say you need a savior, well, why do I need that? Well, go to another passage to learn that you're your sinner, and now you understand the other passage. So real, real quick before we move on, you said I started a draft. A draft for what, Billy? Oh, yes. So after me and Matt did this, this is uh, going back to why we started this podcast. Um, so basically we had a bro down for three months, and it was amazing. Um, as, as the passages in Scripture talk about iron and sharpening iron, that's what me and Matt did. And it, it brought us closer to the truth. And we've, me and Matt have both been teachers. Um, I've been teaching for about 20 years. Matt's been teaching, I don't know how long, probably 10, 5, mm-hmm. something like that. And I've had, uh, I've taught in churches and, and I've actually had a, a website in the past. Um, but we started a online ministry and blog back in January of 2016, so about 10 months ago. And and that's where we put our um, studies uh, of the word, you know, things like our, our Roman study and our soteriology and uh, tough questions about Calvinism. Uh, we have probably over 100 different articles on there. You can find the website at www.biblebrodown.com. Like I said, we have over 100 studies with well over 600 pages. Uh, it's something that we've put together for many months. Uh, we, we throw out an article or a study uh, pretty regularly. You can find a little bit more information about us on the website as well as look at our frequently asked questions about our beliefs. It's just a good uh, resource for you to study and to learn. The goal with the website was to explain what we had come to understand, right? It was, uh, like you said, it was such an eye-opening experience that we wanted to share what we had learned with other people. And uh, we should note up front, or before we get into the, our next point, where we're going to compare kind of where we stand with other people, nothing we've written, nothing we're going to talk about is out of the blue. It's not new. It's not, you know, you hear people talk about, well, if you came up with something new from Scripture, then it's probably wrong. Um, if, you've, if you've listened to any polemic or, or uh, any Christian podcast, you probably heard that saying. Look, nothing just, we're... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah just it's because... It's new. Yeah, just because you've never heard it before doesn't mean anybody else has. Um, we're, we're actually, today we were talking to a guy from Holland. Yeah. Is that where he's from? Or is and it Denmark? We, That's Holland. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he and he said, "Well, I've never heard this before, and that doesn't mean that it's never been taught before. It just it, so many of us have been in the same church growing up or the same denomination growing up, and all we've ever heard is <laughs> that one view. What well, question or a comment or a statement I like to make to people is that you know you think about all the different denominations out there, right? Your Southern Baptist, your Luther, and that's just Protestant, you know, all the various d- different denominations. Did you just happen to get lucky?" to get born into the domination that got everything right. <laughs> I said that to somebody else uh, from another podcast, and they said, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, okay, not much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's you, nothing. We're, so I will say we are Orthodox Christian. There are certain beliefs that every Christian should hold, like, for instance, the Trinity. We definitely believe God is three persons, one being. Uh, we certainly believe that God, uh, the Son, came in the flesh as Christ. There, you know, we're not Gnostics or anything silly. It, we hold to most of, I would say, most of the Baptist faith and message. I think there are some smaller points we might disagree with. Uh, eternal security, I think, being one of them. I haven't looked at it at the 2000 revision lately, but I believe we do disagree with that, and we'll talk about that, of course, in a, probably a couple episodes. But overall, we are absolutely orthodox. Yeah, um, me and Matt have both uh, been in Southern Baptist churches. Um, I yep. think, have you been in anything but Southern Baptist? Nope. All right. So, yeah, I have a little bit more experience at various denominations than Matt. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely consider ourselves um, Orthodox, Protestant, you know, Jesus is God 100%, died on the cross by grace mm-hmm. through faith. All those, we're all, all those sinners, yeah. Yeah, we're all those big things. Um, but uh, going back to you know this idea of Calvinism, so many people go, kind of come from this uh, non-deep theology to 
to getting asked these tough questions just like Matt did back in his day. And then this Calvinist theology, uh, Calvinism theology or Reformed theology seems to have all the answers. The ones that it doesn't have, as Matt mentioned, you know, they just appeal to God's sovereignty or the mystery or who are you to question God. <laughs> what is so amazing is in our systematic that we've, the, the truth that we've discovered through the scripture is that it is so much deeper and bigger uh, the systematic uh, is so much bigger and deeper than Calvinism. Has so many is more discovered, answers. Is discovered the right word? I would maybe maybe come to understand. Yeah, come to know. <laughs> discover discover yeah. seems to sound like we're making it up. Yeah, <laughs> come to know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's it's just better. We don't. I don't read the scripture anymore and feel the need to like. I don't know. We get pick an easy one. Second Peter three nine. Where, it's, where it basically says God wants everybody to be saved. I don't have to read that and try to understand how it, it really means that God only wants some people to be saved. It really means what it really means. It, God wants all people to be saved. Much easier. That said, there's certainly some, I, I think there's some stuff that we're going to talk about in the coming months, weeks, however long this goes, uh, that, that will be challenging. But pro- possibly because of where you're coming from, what your presuppositions are, what kind of theology you hold to right now. That's the point, right? That That's the point of doing this podcast. That's the point of us talking last summer was to challenge each other to, to as it, the scripture says, iron sharpens iron, to, to sharpen each other in the truth because ultimately we want to rightly divide the word of God. Ultimately, we want to, we want to understand what the scripture says because we want to be prepared for every good work. That is our goal. Understand his truth and be prepared. Right. It, it's ultimately, you know, uh, as both being teachers, you know, we want to equip you for every good work, you know, to correct, rebuke, and, and teach you for all righteousness. That's, you know, obviously the bottom line. But on the same side, there's so many people out there who uh, might be in a Reformed church, but never have grasped. They, there's something inside them that just like, this is not right. The, the Calvinistic uh, God seems distant. He seems more of a dictator. He doesn't seem as loving. You know, did, how, how could he tell everybody to do this when he really didn't mean it because he's elected certain individuals at salvation? There are answers in Scripture for all of these. Easy answers, simple answers, answers that are going to just blow your mind on how amazing and wonderful and loving and merciful and patient the Lord is. And, and that, that's, that's why we, we, we were so, um, we, once we went through this, that's why we we're like, we need to have a, have a website. We need to start writing this. Because there's people out there who don't have anywhere to go to find the truth. There's so much lack of teaching out there today, and I think most people would agree with that. We wanted to put that information out there. And the, 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 the format of this is we're going to tell you what we believe, show you why we believe it. But we want you to, to search the scripture, to test what we're, we're saying, to compare it to scripture. Uh, it's obviously going to challenge you because... As Matt mentioned, if you believe in uh, eternal security, we're going to challenge you on that. You, you have to be willing, uh, when you're listening to us, probably to take a peek at your foundations. Would you agree with that, Matt? Yeah, I, I would say that was probably the ch- most challenging thing last summer was the, the idea, or maybe not the idea, the, the feeling that when we were going through everything, if I gave up one point of my Calvinism, if I, if I just let go of any specific thing then the whole system would kind of fall apart and like it it shook me it, it, my faith felt threatened in that sense and really it did, it wasn't until i started to understand the full picture on the other side that i was able to go oh that's better than where i am now and then i moved over and i don't regret it at all i don't look back because calvinism wasn't as good but it, let's let's be honest we're not picking on just calvinism <laughs> we're equal opportunity pickers and we're gonna pick on everybody <laughs> um the, the, yeah, so uh, let, let's go ahead and dive into, I don't know, for the next 10 minutes or so, what, what exactly we are, where we stand, right? So Calvinism is obviously an easy starting point. They have a, a, a nifty little acrostic, TULIP, that is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And if you have never heard that before, <laughs> I recommend you just Wikipedia it. It, I mean, it's, you can, you, you, Ligonier, R.C. Spoll has written a bunch on it. it. Pretty much, you type it into Google, you will find a website that explains to you what the five points of Calvinism are. We disagree with basically all five. For different reasons, we actually have posted that at, at the blog site on why we disagree with them. 
but uh, that's an easy one for us to just say blank, you know, blanketly. We disagree with a little, little more difficult to to explain the differences would be uh, the Armenian and traditionalist site. Uh, Billy, you said you're looking at the 316 website. For yeah, so um, those are probably, I think most people, I always use that term. Most people who study the scripture or are uh, pretty, you know, looking into theology, have, have heard of Calvinism, they've heard of Arminianism. A lot of people yet probably haven't heard of what's called traditionalism, as it's a relatively new term, a new systematic. It was actually started, what, in about 2012 by the Southern Baptist Convention, basically a group of people there who saw how much Calvinism was in infiltrating, taking over, promoted within the Southern Baptist Convention and mm -hmm. said, well, traditional Baptists don't necessarily believe these things. They don't hold to these these doctrines, uh, such as TULIP. Here is what we believe, and here is what we hold to. And it's it's different. It's, very, it's closer to Arminianism than uh, it is to Calvinism, much closer to Arminianism. In fact, I think there's only like one major different point in uh, traditionalism but so yeah we're gonna just real quick we're gonna look at calvinism real here quick arminianism and traditionalism uh, as matt said uh let's start with calvinism you want to you want to go through the shall we go through t and all three of them and then go down the list or do them all yeah i think i think that's the best way so yeah calvinism total depravity it means that we are well depending on who you talk to there are different kinds of calvinists but generally it means that uh we are born dead in our trespasses and sins and that we are incapable of choosing god in any way without him first uh making us born again uh, quickening us revitalizing us so that we can choose him uh in faith uh that's the calvinist position so not only are we unable to basically all we can do is sin right and we can't even seek after god on our own initiative. So the Arminians generally agree with that definition. Yeah, absolutely. It's they, they believe that you need a, correct me if I'm wrong, Billy, you need two graces in order to be uh, saved in, the, or in order to believe under the Arminian tradition. You need first uh, to hear the gospel because you can't, you can't seek what you don't know, Romans 10, unless you, you can't call on the one that you haven't ever heard of. But you also need an extra provenient grace to enable you to respond to that gospel. Right. That would be the Arminian position. Yeah, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think both Calvinism and um, Arminianism basically say when you are born as a child, you are condemned to hell. I'd have to look up, I, I, yes, most Calvinists do, I'd have to look up the Arminian position on children. Without, without going into children, yeah, but you are, in essence, under God's wrath, you know, in, uh, born that way. Yeah, yeah. Instead of being born under grace. Yes, right. that's, uh, I think that's correct. The traditional view is that there is not there is only one grace that you need. It, there, total depravity, and they would reject total depravity as it's defined by Calvinists and Arminians. Uh, they believe that the scripture is a sufficient grace for you to, to, to respond to God in faith. Yeah, traditionalism would agree with original sin that because of Adam, mankind is under sin in, a, in other words he we cannot work our way to righteousness we cannot but we are not born under god's wrath they they definitely hold that children um are under god's grace because they do not yet understand good and evil um and it is not until you know they they grasp the con the the good and evil um as kind of you know going to what we believe in exodus uh, when they when they reach that age of understanding good and evil and are able to choose good and refuse evil, that's when they become accountable to sin and they are 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 held account. They, they're basically that's when they become under God's wrath. The the major distinction between um, Calvinism, Arminianism, and traditionalism is basically in a, the inability part. You know, while we are sinners, we still have through the through the hearing of the word, through the hearing of the gospel, we can <laughs> respond to that. We uh, basically, uh, big picture, we are what would hold to the tradi traditional view, traditionalism view, that you are not born dead in your sins. You are not born um, under God's wrath. Uh, we've uh, went into detail on this, and we'll go into detail later in the blog in our in our in our podcast. But uh, children are born under God's grace because they do not yet understand good and evil, and they cannot choose good and evil. Um, they are covered by by Christ by Christ's 
atonement. God doesn't hold their sin over them. Um, uh, just a not, s- well, simple picture. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say not that not that people are born without original sin. Everybody's right. born under the curse of Adam. Not that children don't sin because we're both fathers and we know that those little boogers sin. But God, they're under grace. That God is not holding them accountable for that sin. So I just want to clarify that real quick. Yeah. Uh, biggest, the simplest picture of this is um, when you look at the Exodus. God, uh, Israel uh, was in the wilderness, and God said that you know that they wouldn't enter the promised land, which was a shadow of obviously our promised land of heaven, eternal life. But the children would enter the promised land because they did not yet understand good and evil. And they could not choose evil or, or, or a good. So God I mean, God didn't even discipline them because they didn't understand evil. He disciplined their parents. He didn't allow their parents to go to the promised land, but he allowed them to go. They, they were under his grace because he did not hold them accountable for their sin. All right. You'll find you'll find that at the end of Deuteronomy 1, by the way. So Yeah. Um, all right. You? Ready? Yeah. The conditional election. Uh, the Calvinist view. And they're the only ones who hold this. Uh, Armenian traditionalists and us would all disagree with it, but the Calvinists uh, understand that, well, if someone is totally depraved, God, prior to the foundation of the world, if you read Ephesians 1, they read it this way, prior to the foundation of the world, God chose who would be in Christ. Individually, he chose individuals to be saved, and that is unconditional, based strictly on his sovereignty, his will. We don't know what criteria, anything. We just know that he chose who was going to be elect? Unconditional election. The uh, like I said, Armenians, traditionalists, us. We would we would agree across the board that is untrue. We would hold to what you would call a corporate election for uh, Ephesians one. Uh, God uh, for the foundation of the world. Uh, God foreknew those in Christ as a group of people, not individuals that He picked to be in Christ, but that He knew who would be in Christ. Um, same with. Uh, Romans 8, 28 through 30, 31, that God foreknew those who love him, that he is foreknowing the people who have faith, who are seeking him. Uh, those are his elect. Uh, so we definitely would disagree with the Calvinists in that point. Uh, I think, yeah, um, I think Arminians, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe this is the, the nothing category, <laughs> uh, but there's the view that God looks down the corridors of time to see who's going to believe and then picks them and those are the ones that he's predestined that's mm, that's yeah, kind yeah. of a, I, I actually i don't think armenians or traditionalists hold that view i think that's the that ignorantians that... <laughs> ignorantian <laughs> view yeah um simple simple easy way to um show you that 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 cannot be possible is that for god to look down the quarters of time to learn something is completely against god's omniscience right You're, yeah he, he... <laughs> he, he's not going to foreknow something and then change it because it changes what he foreknew. That's that's a whole different. That's yeah, if, a whole different yeah, podcast. If, he, if 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 you know, it's just simple that you know, if God knows everything, then he he then he he it's he can't look into the future to learn something new. He he just knows yeah, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the Armenians, uh, the the traditionalists, they would hold that God basically prior to creation, God. Um, set the plan of how everybody is is going to be saved. As as Matt mentioned in Romans eight, you know God basically in the beginning said, "All those who love me will be conformed to the image of my Son." And this is talking about, and we're all conformed to Christ at the resurrection, which is why he says later on, you know, those who were called, justified, and glorified, all past tense. You know, they at, at the resurrection we will all be conformed to the image of Christ in our glorified bodies, right? And those who have been glorified were also the same ones that Christ justified through faith and called through faith. Doesn't mean that there's only, you know, that was the only people that God called, just that those specific people had definitely received that call. It was all the, the, the as, what was that term that Calvinists used, the golden chain of redemption? Isn't that what that yeah. is? Yeah, uh, the crimson thread of redemption. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this is very similar to John 6, which is a Calvinist stronghold. But, uh, yeah, we're taking it back it, it, where it talks about those who have heard and learned from the Father. Uh, those are the ones that are drawn to uh, Christ. Well, it, it, just because those – it just like you said, it, people can learn from the Father. Those people who learned also heard. It doesn't mean that everybody who heard learned. It, there's a category error there. Error there. But, yeah, that, again, that's yeah, even, in the weeds right now. Yeah. 
But, but even uh, in the New Testament, it talked about the the Pharisees and the and the leaders who who learned and understood what Christ is talking about, and even kind of sort of believed he he was who he said he was, but they didn't trust in him because they followed the leaders instead. So yeah, they learned, but or they heard, but they didn't learn. They didn't put faith in in, in God. And and this is obviously the it, the you of tulip obviously flies in the face of any kind of free will that man has or the responsibility of man to respond to God to respond to the gospel uh, to come and believe as uh, as John six says which is the work of God to to uh, eternal life so uh, limited atonement is the third point and it is basically that the atonement that Christ's death burial and resurrection uh, paid the price. Under Calvinism, they understand that it, it was the paying the price for all of the elect. That it is sufficient for the entire world. Everybody, it could pay for the sins of every single person ever, but it is only effective, it is only efficient for the elect, the ones that God chose before time to be saved. Uh, again, same with unconditional election. All the Arminians, traditionalists, us, we all agree. Uh, limited atonement is false. It is It is a universal atonement meant for everybody. And uh, this is kind of where we start to differ from some of the from the other two, uh, in terms of how it actually it gets to everybody. Yeah, your your Calvinist would tell you and start doing some scriptural jujitsu um, on what <laughs> Christ meant when he said he died for all, or you know whosoever believes, or you know God desires all to be saved. That's 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 when they start doing scriptural jujitsu to 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 keep their limited atonement um, doctrine. The scripture is pretty clear uh, and 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 simplistic in, in saying that you know Christ died, you know to to those what is it, how does it say to those who believed and even for the unbeliever what's how's that path? You know I, I would use my my keyboard and my and my computer and look it up, but Matt said I can't because you guys will hear it. <laughs> so um, we'll eventually be able to do that, but we'll learn how to do mute. We'll figure this um, but, whole deal out. Yeah, right. but there's also, you know, I, I think it's in Peter where Peter says that, you know, the, talking about the false teachers, the unbelieving false teachers who um, deny the master who bought them. So these are unbelievers who the master is obviously Christ. Christ obviously bought them through his death and death and atonement on the cross. This uh, this idea that ma- – not idea. <laughs> the, the, the big difference, I say, I guess, in um, Arminianism and traditionalism is that – we actually realize how the work on the cross is for everyone. Without Christ dying on the cross, no one could be offered salvation. It's because he died on the cross that God can offer salvation to all. As Romans 3 says, the end of chapter 3 says that, you know, because of Christ dying on the cross, God was able to show patience and mercy and pass over the sins of everybody in the past in order to offer, in order to offer them salvation. Yeah, and one obstacle that, that really anybody who's going to think about this subject will face, and this is something we'll probably spend a couple episodes talking about, is what do you do with those people who never heard the gospel? What I mean, it, depending on how you define the gospel, the vast majority of the world never heard it. So we have come to understand that God has taken it upon himself to make sure that everybody knows what the gospel is. We, we define it slightly differently. It's not to say that, <laughs> that we believe Christ is not part of the gospel, but we believe that that it is the, I guess I'll just go ahead and t- say it. We believe the gospel is that anybody who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now they're saved based on the work of Christ. Uh, from the beginning of time uh, up until Christ, God was passing over people based on Christ's work. So He, Jesus is the beginning, the end, the, the, the fulfillment of the gospel. But he was always a mystery, right? The, for 4,000 years, people didn't know who he was. They just trusted God to save them. So that message, call on the name of the Lord to be saved, that has gone out to the entire world. How that is, through what, you know, why that is, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But without some kind of explanation for a universal witness, and I'm not, we're, not, we're not universalists, that's not what we're saying, universal witness of the gospel that God has done, without that, you cannot have a universal atonement. If you, have, if you believe that the gospel is limited and has only gone out to a certain amount of people, and we know from Romans 1 that the gospel is the power of God into salvation, then you have to admit that the atonement is limited. Well, we don't believe that. We, we can explain why it's both universal witness and a universal atonement. So, Yeah, just to clarify uh, that idea, well, well, what do you mean that if everybody hasn't heard the gospel, then I have to believe in limited atonement? If only certain people hear the gospel, then God has determined who is going to hear it, 
So mm-hmm. you believe in a, in, in basically in a limited atonement. If not everybody is even offered, if not everybody, it, then Christ didn't die for everybody. But because he has died for all people, and, and salvation is now available to all people, God offers salvation to all people. This doesn't mean that everybody sins, uh, you know, everybody's going to heaven. It just means that because Christ, it, it's, uh, we were talking about this earlier today, you know, we are all under the sin of Adam, but we are all also covered and passed, right now our sins are passed over by the work of Christ on the cross. Not not forgiven, just passed over. They're passed over so that God can show patience, patience and mercy and offer salvation to all. As John says, you know, that, you know, Christ came in the world to be a light, you know, so that all might all might believe through him. That's why Christ came. That's why he died. So all might believe through him. It's it's the if you if you go back to like we'll we'll go into this detail. But you know if you go back to the Exodus, you know the Passover lamb was put uh, and, and and allowed Israel to be freed from their slavery and go into the wilderness. They were led through the wilderness by the Spirit of God and offered manna and offered water. That is a picture of us, the entire world, in the wilderness of the world. God is, is using his spirit to lead us to the promised land. He's offering us the bread of life, the water of life, and we have to accept that through faith in order to enter the promised land. But the Passover lamb applied to everybody. God passed, when, when Israel was freed, you know, by the blood of the lamb, they, they didn't suffer that immediate death that God brought, that immediate judgment that he brought on Egypt and Pharaoh. They were passed over. It doesn't mean that they were no longer sinners. It just means that God passed over in judging them at that moment. And, and it was... let, yeah, the friend that we were talking to actually called it a, tem- a temporal passing, uh, passing over. It, yes. He, he passed over it right now in time so that we have the opportunity to respond. But, you know, it, eventually we will be held accountable for whatever decision it is. We make. And, and, and if you're the one to look into this, uh, it's in, you know, the bottom of Romans chapter chapter 3, I think 24, 26 t- place where, where, you know, Christ passed, you know, God passed over the sins of all in order that all you know, could it be offered salvation? And then Paul goes into details about, you know, even even Abraham himself, his sins were passed over so, so that he could be offered salvation through faith. And he did. Abraham believed God and God credited him as righteousness. We know that all people from Adam to the end of time who uh, are credited righteousness are credited righteousness based on Christ's work on the cross. Yep. No ifs, ands, or buts. There's no way to receive righteousness unless it comes through Christ. <laughs> So if at any point now or like uh, so far or in the future you think, man, these guys are taking Jesus out of the gospel, no, you're wrong. We, <laughs> it is all based on him. So, uh, yeah, if you hadn't guessed, we've we've gotten that objection before. We flatly reject it. Uh, they just simply didn't understand what we were saying. So, ready to irresistible grace? Yep. Irresistible grace again. Same thing as the last two. Calvinists believe one thing. The rest of us believe another. And, and I hope you've picked up by now, we're talking about Protestants, we're not talking about Roman Catholic, that's a completely different animal. Calvinists believe that irresistible grace is the grace that God gives to his elect that re- rejuvenates them. It brings them to spiritual life, and because they are spiritually alive, they will, quote-unquote, freely choose him. They will understand what it is he's done for them, they will grasp the the gravity of their sin and the the awesomeness of the atonement and they will repent in faith. The Arminians, traditionalists, us, we all agree that grace is not irres- uh, irresistible. It is absolutely resistible. Uh, just anecdotally, you can look around your life and see that people resist that grace all the time. People who have heard the gospel, uh, people that you know were raised in church and flatly reject it. Now the Calvinists would say, well, they weren't elect. So that's why they, they rejected it. We would say, no, uh, if you look at Romans one, for instance, uh, everybody is without excuse. Anybody who, who, uh, suppresses the truth, does so in their unrighteousness, they are trading in the truth for lies. Another good spot for this, I guess, would be the parable of the sower, right? Everybody receives the word. The first soil just flatly rejects it offhand. It doesn't say that, that they were made that way so that they would. It, it, it implies that they had the choice and they rejected it, and so God gave them over. The second soil and the third soil, either uh, persecution, they let it go because they were persecuted, or they allowed the worries of the world to choke out their faith. And then the last soil is the one are the ones who grabbed hold of that, who who took the gospel and in in faith uh, held on to that hope of being reborn like Christ. So yeah, irresistible grace we would we would flatly reject as well. 
Yeah, and Matt kind of mentioned this before, but it's kind of uh, uh, we should probably. So with with Armenians, they because they believe in total depravity, they believe that so, so Calvinism believes in basically regeneration precedes faith that God has to supernaturally regenerate your spirit in order for you to even seek God. And then when the gospel comes, you will believe it. The Arminian view is that God um, sends you a grace, a pre- they call it prevenient grace. I guess it's the same kind of thing of regeneration, but it, Arminianism, it's not regenerating you. It's just quickening you in order for you to be able to hear and seek and uh, respond to the gospel. Armenians all obviously believe that you can resist that, but God still has to awaken your spirit in order for you to respond. Traditionalists do not believe that. They believe that um, you have a choice to start with. We are dichotomous creatures. Is that the right yeah. word? Yeah, that we, we are a flesh and spirit. Our flesh is is weak. It's It's that... Um, uh, any, anyone who is following after their flesh cannot please God, fully, fully support that. However, we're also uh, given the spirit of, uh, we have the spirit of God. He's, he's the one that breathed life into us. And uh, through his spirit witnessing to us, we are able to respond to uh, his word, to the gospel. That's, that's why the scripture says, you know, the, the gospel is the power of God uh, to salvation to all who believe. It is the power of God, the gospel, the word, his word is powerful enough for us to respond to. To think that God created a creature um, who he wants to be saved and then that creature can't even respond to God's own words is, is to me, ludicrous. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So we would um, definitely hold to the, the traditional view there, probably hand-in-hand uh, hand what they believe. Yep. And then the last one. To you, oh, Perseverance of the Saints. Yeah, uh, Perseverance of the Saints. So this one's a little tricky. The Calvinists should be pretty clear by now. If God brought this dead person to life and and basically manipulated them to believe, then he will, and they're elect, then he is going to obviously continue to manipulate circumstances and them so that they will continue to choose him until they die. And they die in faith and are saved. But in Calvinism, what happens if you know somebody says they believe and then they don't later? Uh, they were never saved. They were never elect. They were just deceived for a while. And and trust me, we will hit on that point. Who deceived them? <laughs> eventually. Uh, God allowed them to be deceived. Maybe a demon did. You don't know. But uh, God ordained for that person to be deceived for a time and then to be to fall away. He let that happen. And they are judged based on that. They are. Uh, he is just, they would say, in allowing them to fall away because they are sinning. They They are choosing to do it. And so... He is going to punish them based on their choice. We would see that as kind of a robotic God manipulating things. And at the end of the day, if if a consistent Calvinist is going to be hard pressed to explain why that isn't God causing sin. um, Yeah, we we flatly reject that idea. The Arminian view. I think Arminians actually allow for uh, the Mm -hmm. idea that a person can can reject to rebel to uh, abandon abandon their faith yeah thank you just like there are so many scriptures uh i think one of the best ones is john 15 when christ is talking about he is the vine and believers are the branches uh the ones who bear fruit will remain in him uh if they abide in his love they will bear fruit and t- uh, anybody who makes it to the end having persevered to the end is saved anybody who doesn't doesn't have faith or abandons that faith will eventually not bear fruit. Uh, that's you, you see that reflected in James' words when he says that uh, faith without works is dead. So uh, Jesus is talking about someone who stops to bear fruit or doesn't bear fruit, who is in him. Well, that person has, it, it, that that is evidence of their lack of faith. And they are cut off, they wither, and they are thrown in fire. Well, if you believe in, to- in, in, in perseverance of the saints or if you believe in eternal security, you can have a really hard time explaining to me why God is cutting cutting someone off of being in Christ and throwing them into fire, which is obviously symbolic of hell. So, uh, traditionalists, on the other hand, would would do hold to eternal security. I'm not even try to defend it. I, I can't tell you why at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, interesting that they believe completely believe that you can freely respond to God, that you don't need prevenient grace, that you know the gospel is a power to salvation, but yet when you put faith in the lord that he forever seals you uh i think they use the the verse about god who who started a good work in you will will see Mm -hmm. it perfected or i'm butchering that verse i know it but yeah we'll talk about all that we'll cover every verse from all or every position from all sides 
when we cover uh, Once Saved, Always Saved, Eternal Security uh, in a later podcast. We have covered the, all of these topics already on our website. And if you want to, you know, steal away and go look at those and find out what we believe, you can you can check them out there. But we will be going over them in the podcast and taking your questions and all that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of, we do have a an email address. Uh, it's BibleBroDown at gmail.com. Pretty easy, all one word. Uh, look forward to your questions. Um, yeah, that, again, just to reiterate, the point of this podcast is to kind of help facilitate discussions between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ, similar to what we went through. Because at the end of the day, Billy and I are both convinced that if, we're, if, if we've come upon the truth, if we fully understand this the way we think we do, then if we ask the right questions and we prod the right way, you will, with your friends, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, come to the same conclusion. Because it's not really our truth. It, Billy and I didn't make this up. We, we are telling you what we believe God has, spoke, has spoken uh, through his word. You will come to that same truth because it's his, not ours. We just It's such a blessing that he has has made himself known. Probably one of the biggest differences, and, and the reason it's, I think we should mention it now, is because it is the biggest difference, is, uh, as kind of Matt kind of sort of touched on earlier, is our understanding of what is the gospel. Again, me and Matt have, have I grew up Southern Baptist. We have went through every verse about, you know, whoever believes in Jesus is going to be saved. We 100% agree with that, first of all, that, you know, if you believe in Jesus and call upon Jesus as your Savior, you will be saved. But there is a, a little bit more to it than that. The gospel, obviously, is the good news. The good news that we can receive salvation by faith in the Lord. Uh, Matt mentioned earlier that this, this simple gospel is whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. A simple question to ask yourself is, what name do we call upon? You know, that, that verse, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord... Uh, will be saved is an Old Testament passage. Ask yourself, has, has the gospel changed from Adam until today? You know, did Abraham have the same gospel as us? Did the Jews have the same gospel as us? Did Elijah, did the disciples? Did Adam. Yeah. yeah. Did the, the, the disciples before Christ, you know, died and, and was resurrected, did were the, were, were the disciples saved? Did they believe in the gospel? You know, people say, oh, well, yeah, you, you have to believe in in the specific name of Jesus, and you have to believe that he died and was resurrected. If, if you hold to that view, well, I, I'd urge you to go read John 20. After Jesus had died, uh, Mary goes to the tomb and sees that he's gone, and, you know, they go and get John and Peter, and, and John gets there first because he's faster. Uh, it's actually in the scripture that, that John gets there first because he's faster. So now we know who is, who is the sprinter. But it says that they, they didn't understand what was going on. They didn't fully grasp that Christ had risen from the dead. They'd been with the Lord for three years, but yet did not understand that he was going to die and be raised from the dead. So if, if they had to believe that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, then they, according to that that criteria, they were not saved, even at that point. So, so well, go uh, ahead. <laughs> let's, let, yeah, let's not give too we Honestly, people, we could talk for the next like four hours, but it's, we're coming up on an hour, so hey, Billy, if you're cool with it, I'm going to put a bow on it. And uh, I, I, I like what you did. I, I think every podcast we should end with a question that we want you to take back and chew on. I mean, this is not, we're not going to be going over the milk of the word. The, the milk is the gospel. We're, we want meat and potatoes, yo. We're, we want to be able to dig in, and we want you and your brothers and sisters in Christ to dig in and really understand. And, and I'm going to borrow something from Chris Rosebro over at Power Christian Radio. Uh, don't listen to us with an open mind. Don't listen to us with an open heart. Uh, listen to us with an open Bible. Be a Berean. Test the scriptures. Uh, or go to the scriptures to confirm or deny whatever it is we're saying. We are open to correction. We are happy to be corrected because ultimately we want to be conformed to God's truth, not our own. So, again, I'm going to throw out the question that Billy did, and I encourage you to, to really think about it. Don't just dismiss it. Um, what is the gospel? In a nutshell, what what is the gospel? If it's if we're all saved, if the gospel is the power of God into salvation, and we know there are people saved from Adam all the way through uh, right now, us. What exactly is it? How do you define that? Again, we, we've already told you we we base it all on Christ, but how? So you have our definition. I encourage you to talk about it. Would love to, to hear your questions. Yeah, yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a little bit of more um, fruit out there or little uh, tidbits. In answering that question, does your gospel apply to everybody from beginning to end, right? 
does it apply to Rahab, who is quoted in Hebrews as having righteousness through faith? Yeah. You know, and she's she's a Gentile who saw the Jews and heard about their God and put faith in him, period. No knowledge of anything else. Does it apply to Noah? Does it apply to Abraham, who Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness? Does it apply to the disciples? Does it apply to us? You know, has anything changed? Th- think about that question. Again, I would, scripture is pretty clear that no one enters heaven without Christ. And we 100% <laughs> agree with that. No one is enters heaven without Christ, without his death and burial and resurrection, his atonement covering us for our sins. No one, not one person. Ask yourself and, and study the scripture. Find out what the gospel is. Do it. Do a word search for gospel or good news and, and go read all the passages in scripture about it. Uh, you, your eyes might be opened if you let them. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. God bless, and we hope you come back next time.